So that concludes yes. the formal. Yes. Um, so I should put, we have a couple of minutes for questions here, and we know that you have a pane here that you can type in your questions, and uh, we would be more than happy to try and answer as many as we can in the time that we have available. It's Michael here in Montreal. I will start with, let's see, here's one that came in a couple of minutes ago. She's responding to the, the misrecognitions that happened in the hospital that you just listed. And she says, what are some ways in which practitioners can avoid these misrecognitions and provide appropriate and dignified care? Right. So question of misrecognition, and this is something that obviously very much happened during Sinclair's time in the waiting room, but I think it's also important to note that it's continued to happen. And one of the things that we've really come back to is the way in which in the media, Sinclair is still often described as homeless, which he wasn't. He is still sometimes described as somebody who might have just been looking somewhere to pass the time when it's clear from what we know about his life mm -hmm. that he has places to go and people to see and things to do. So misrecognition happens in multiple ways and at real cost. And I don't know, I mean, neither Professor McCallum and I are experts in this particular process. Certainly cultural sensitivity, anti-racist training is something that activists have urged for a long time. And it's something that I think we have continued to try and promote and support. But it's something perhaps that people who work in those sorts of frontline positions are perhaps best able to suggest how these dynamics can be shifted up. When we think about this question of how to avoid misrecognition, similar questions that we've been asked are how have things changed over the past 10 years and if things have gotten better. And to that question, I want to make sure uh, the, the cultural sensitivity training and anti-racist training plays a role, but that those interventions, I guess, uh, shouldn't stand alone, that they should function with other forms of change. And one of those is thinking big and thinking about some of the themes that we talked about in the book about dispossession, and more specifically in the return of land and the resolution of land claims and the redistribution of resources. And these are much bigger questions, but I think that it's fair to keep those on the table. When we're talking about misrecognition, a lot of that is that we don't see Indigenous people and Indigenous history. So turning to ways that we can more prominently put Indigenous people back onto the territory. So one of the questions that came in is, since so many of the encounters were with nurses, I wondered if you wanted to comment on the impact of nursing institutions, education, as it relates to First Nations people. So one of the things that I was struck by as I read this testimony is the importance of nurses as frontline workers, but also you get a sense about the many other things that are actually happening in a hospital waiting room. There's a lot of contact with security guards, and there's also a lot of involvement and it's probably worth sitting with it a little bit of people who were in the emergency room waiting for medical care for themselves or their families as well, who actually worked to advocate for Mr. Sinclair. And so I think we can think about nurses, and, and this is something that, that Professor McCallum has worked on the history of, of nursing, and in particular of Indigenous women as nurses may have something in particular to add. Certainly the early Indigenous Nurses Association, when it formed in 1970, part of their agenda was to identify inequality in healthcare and also to advocate in particular for First Nations patients and First Nations communities in the healthcare system. And ultimately, I think that initially their role was self-determination in healthcare. Their goal was to have that system belong to them. And we're not there. We still have this structure that is by and large not of, uh, of Indigenous peoples making and a structure in which people are indifferent towards Indigenous people. And I think that Indigenous nurses make a large difference in that system, but as long as the structure is there, that they're always going to be competing against that, that way of seeing that becomes a part of the culture of the work environment. But one related response to that that we've noted before is that there is often, I think, my sense is there's been a lot of emphasis on doing training and cultural safety and other training with doctors. And, mm -hmm. and if you go through our bare bones timeline, just to draw it out, Brian Sinclair was never seen by a doctor. Mm -hmm. 
So we could have had the world's most culturally sensitive, engaged, on top of it doctors, and he never thought that. And so I do think it does really raise attention to the particular point of the healthcare that his story occurred in is one that perhaps we need to really think about, to think about security guards, about housekeeping, about the people in the room, about nurses, as which the question raises. Had Brian been previously admitted to the ER, was he known to the staff members? Right. That's a really good question. Um, he had been previously admitted to health sciences. But my, if I remember this correctly, he, I think, on average, visited that emergency room six times a year, which is not a particularly significant number of times. So in the sense, there was some discussion in the first stage of the inquest that he was a quote-unquote frequent flyer. And I think our sense is that six times within a year, mm-hmm. and on average, doesn't necessarily amount to that. It is clear that some of the folks who testified before the inquest thought they knew who he was. It's not clear by my reading, at least. Perhaps Mary Jane can add to that as well. It's not clear to me they did actually know exactly who he was, and mm-hmm. they were perhaps associating him with someone else. Many of you will know much more than I will yeah. about this. He was somebody who had been in the city's major emergency room, and it was the one closest to his home, and it was the one his primary health care team directed him to, but he was not a particularly familiar presence. So I'm going to ask one last question. How will this story be disseminated to the public? Healthcare workers are part of the public, and many of these structures of indifference are publicly generated and fostered. Part of our thinking about how we respond to this was that we wanted to lend our knowledge as historians to this understanding of this case. In doing that, we're obviously not the only individuals who are responding to it. There are a number of journals who've written pieces for uh, newspapers across the country about the 10-year anniversary and about Brian Sinclair. This case, as you've mentioned, some people have mentioned already in this webinar, has been taught in schools. So this is happening everywhere, and, and this was our goal that we played in it. We wanted to create a book that was short, relatively short. It's, I think, about 150 pages. It's small, but that can be easily taught. Um, and so we're hoping that it gets picked up in courses and that it shows a case study of some of these Brian Sinclair stories that happen across the country and can be used in different ways that way. Okay, given that we are very close to the time when we're going to be cut off from the webinar. (laughs) I wanted to very much thank the two of you for coming here and providing this excellent presentation. I highly recommend this book to those who are interested in knowing more. Um, You can also contact Dr. Mary Jane Logan McCallum or Dr. Val Perry at these links and emails. As well, you will find on the PowerPoint presentations that have been shared that there are additional resources on both the National Collaborating Center for Aboriginal Health website as well as the National Collaborating Center for Healthy Public Policy. I just want to thank everybody for being part of this webinar, and we look forward to future webinars that you may attend. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you. you.